Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the mailbox for the 30th of September 2011. My name is Total Biscuit, bringing you a daily dose of community interaction, gaming discussion, and all that good stuff. You can email in mailbox at cynicalbrit.com. That is mailbox at cynicalbrit.com with topics for future shows. The game in the background is Battlefield 3, Operation Metro once again. Rezzing people. I am playing a medic in the way that it's intended. Rez, 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 rez. Points, points, points. Love this one. First email comes in from the Dr. Francis. Recently, as you know, and have played League of Legends, finally released Dominion. What? <laughs> That's not a real sentence. Am I reading that wrong? I'm trying to figure that one out. Recently, as you know, and have played. I suppose if there was a comma there, that would have actually made sense. Recently, as you know, and have played, comma, League of Legends finally released Dominion. Still a clumsy sentence, but whatever. I love the mode and find it very fast-paced and enjoyable. I love the game times being around 20 minutes rather than upwards of at least 40, especially since my limited schedule between work and college. I play LOL socially, and I don't generally play ranked games, but rather just play normal with my friends. Since its release, I've been enjoying playing the game, devising tactics, modifying all my builds on all the champions I normally play. Unfortunately, most of my friends either do not like Dominion because it is too fast-paced, or they feel it's incredibly unbalanced, or they're indifferent about the game time. This leads me and generally one other of my friends to having a great time while the rest are quiet and don't seem to enjoy themselves. My question to you is, how do you feel about Dominion? And I know you've been busy as of late, but have you had a split opinion on Dominion with your group of League buddies? Eh, to some degree. But a lot of them are playing Dominion as a, okay, we've played enough Summoners Rift, let's play some Dominion kind of game type. As in, they want to just play it to get away from Summoner's Rift for a while. Personally, I'm playing it as my primary format because I just want to take a big break away from Summoner's Rift. And Summoner's Rift has got... I wouldn't say stale. It's just got to the point where I get too frustrated with it, whereas Dominion is much more fast-paced. The funny thing about the imbalance, by the way, is that ranked games are significantly less imbalanced because the champions, who are generally really, really good in that game time, usually get banned. I mean, for instance, Ramus, Akali... Gangplank. Those are the three big ones that are absolutely ridiculous. Shaco to a lesser degree, Wukong to a lesser degree, sometimes Evelyn. But, I mean, it's mostly those three, really. Akali, Ramus, and Gangplank are just really, really good on that map. But I wouldn't exactly call it imbalance. I'd just say that that's the current state of the meta game. I mean, it's the same reason that you ban Annie all the time and Amumu all the time. We've been banging Amumu for eight months. Would you say that Amumu is overpowered? No, he's not. He's just really, really good, and he's part of a really good team comp. I think that people need to distinguish between a champion having an extremely high place in the tier list of the meta game and a champion being actually overpowered. There are some occasions when a champion is, without question, overpowered, or indeed underpowered. But most of the time, it's, well, just the way that people currently play, this champion ends up having quite a lot of superiority. That doesn't mean that the champion is imbalanced, and in general, you should consider that before shouting for nerfs or whatever. Anyway, it's kind of besides the point. Some people are going to like Dominion, some people aren't. It is a fairly severe departure from the normal MOBA model. It really is mostly just like a Rathi Basin in WoW, and if you're not used to capture and hold style of gameplay, you probably get a bit freaked out by it. Personally, I like it because it's an accelerated experience. It's got a lot of the things that I like about playing League of Legends, the idea of leveling up, the idea of acquiring items, the idea of getting the team fights, the idea of ganking, sniping people, getting kills, stuff like that, the idea of last minute saves, but it condenses it down into a very fast paced format. So you're always gaining new items, you're always gaining new abilities, the pace of the game keeps going, it never drags on for more than 25 minutes, it just physically can't. So it's good. But some people aren't going to like it, and that's fine. It's good that there's a bit of variety in it, though. I was actually very skeptical about the game type before I got my hands on it. I played a lot of it, and I really like it. I think it's a great way to take it. And as far as I'm concerned, once it's properly balanced out, I would say that that's the way that League of Legends needs to go in terms of spectator esports, because there are some nail biters in that game. Massive nail biters, and there's always action going on. So it's a much, much better spectator esport. That and the fact that it never goes on for an hour either, that really helps. And any of you who remember watching the Dota 2 games at the International in Cologne, oh my god, you know what I'm talking about when it comes to hour-long games dragging on. So, League of Legends Dominion is a good competitive format. I think that it needs some work, the meta game needs to evolve, the strategies need to be put into place, people have got to figure that stuff out, but at the moment I see it as an extremely exciting and enjoyable format.
This one comes in from Mark that says, as you may or may not know, EA and Bioware's upcoming MMO, Star Wars The Old Republic, has received a large amount of criticism in regards to their staggered release, where they are only allowing certain countries access to the beta, as well as the original release of the game. The main demographic shunned by EA is the Australasian community, with EA claiming that the release will be delayed in these countries so that they can deliver an exceptional game with an exceptional service to go with it, and that they are trying to build a great gaming community. This doesn't justify the delayed launch, as segregating a community seems to be counterintuitive to their goal of making a great one. Also, claims that they are simply having trouble with oceanic release related servers seem to be groundless as many people from my country Australia have pre-ordered the game off Amazon and have no trouble with the beta using US or Euro servers. What are your thoughts on the matter? Are EA being unreasonable or should the delayed communities just grin and bear it? In the long run, is it just better for them? Well, I suppose in the long run it is better for them because they're getting specific servers and latency could potentially be a problem going forward. We don't know how bad lag is going to affect the end game stuff. We don't know how bad lag is going to come into the equation when the servers get more populated as opposed to what they are in the beta right now, which I have to assume is fairly sparse. That said, there's nothing really stopping people just from buying another version. I have to wonder if it's that restricted. I would think that it would make more sense to simply allow the Australian guys to buy the game on Origin if they so desire, notify them, look, this is a US release. Maybe give them the option once it's released to transfer back over. It doesn't make any sense to delay people getting into the game because the longer they wait, the more competition comes their way. Let's be honest, their main competitor when it comes to dealing with this, and let's just ignore WoW for a second, when it comes to new games, is probably Guild Wars 2. And the longer they wait, the closer Guild Wars 2 actually gets. And let's bear in mind that Guild Wars 2 doesn't have a sub-fee. That is something to consider. So, as far as I'm concerned, they should be allowing, if they don't already, an Australian to purchase online, via the digital system, an American version or a European version, Put a disclaimer on it, say, look, this may end up lagging, so we're not responsible for this nonsense. And then, once they've got everything sorted out, set up the Australian server, launch it, and allow a free character transfer off of the American one. And some people can stay on the American and European ones if they want to. Maybe they've already cultivated friends, and some can then move back to Australia and get better ping. So they can compromise in that regard. I'm never in favor of regional segregation for MMO games, ever. I have the same problem with Blizzard with WoW. I have the same problem with Blizzard with StarCraft. Same problem with Blizzard with Diablo 3, funnily enough. Blizzard is the one that leads the way in terms of this absolute goddamn nonsense. And I do not approve of it one little bit. Staggered launch, I've just given you the reasons there. You know, it, if it provides better service, that's okay. Whether it will or will not, I don't know. But it doesn't seem to make any sense, even from a business perspective, to turn around and then deny people the ability to purchase the game via legitimate means, as opposed to just trying to get a key from something like Off Gamers. Not to say that Off Gamers is illegitimate, I'm just saying it's sort of grabbing a key from a third party site, as opposed to just buying it straight off their store. It doesn't make any sense to stop that. It really doesn't harm anybody at all. You just claim the damn thing, you put a big giant sign up that says, look, you're buying the American version, and you just leave it at that. And of course, if anyone complains, you just point them to that boilerplate and say, Oi, look, simple as that. You bought it, you paid your money, you take your choice. Wait till the Australian ones come out. That's all I can really say on the matter, to be honest. And I'm hoping that it works out okay for you guys, because quite frankly, Australia gets screwed on games, and I'm not a big fan of it. We live in a connected world, supposedly, and it seems like a lot of game companies don't seem to realize that. I would love to know why. Blizzard, as I said, is the biggest offender, and it sucks. It doesn't even make any sense. Blizzard provided a Battle.net service for the longest time that allowed you to switch between regions at will without any problem whatsoever, and suddenly they throw this nonsense in. The only reason I could come up with is to make more money. It's really as simple as that, and that is a absolutely disgraceful reason. It's consumer unfriendly, it's money grubbing, it's horrendous. And when it comes down to MMOs, that really is BS, because honestly, it comes down to what a person individually wants from an MMO when they play. What about people who are on Night Shift, for instance? Often you'll have those guys playing at unusual times, and they would rather play on an American server because they've got more people to play with. 
Think about that for a second. People are different. They can't just be put into the same category. Say, all right, everyone in Australia works nine to five, sleeps at exactly the same hours. BS. And that does not apply to any other country either. There is no way to classify such people. You cannot do it. It's a ridiculous stereotype. And what if I want to play with people that I know from various other different gaming communities? You want to build a community, you've got to understand that communities are built from other communities. Friends come from other games. I know guys that I've been playing all sorts of different games with, and MMOs going back six, almost ten years now, in fact, if I were to count some of the browser-based stuff that I used to do. So that is what makes a vibrant community, and those are the kind of people I want to interact with. I don't want to get involved in your greater community, whatever the hell that is, and by community you mean your sodding forums, let's be honest, because that's all Blizzard really does to encourage its community, it puts up a forum, then helps for the best. I'm not part of that community. The community I'm a part of is the people that I know and the people that I've interacted with over the past six or so years, and those people don't live in the same country. And you know what? I should be able to play with those people without too much of a problem. And that applies to any company, any MMO, Bioware included. This one comes in from Marvin, who says, I was wondering how big a problem, if any, you think nostalgia is when it comes to judging and or reviewing games. A personal example, as a kid, aged 10 to 12, I absolutely loved Final Fantasy 7, 8, and 9, amongst other games. However, when I play modern RPGs, or even RPGs of the same PS1 era, at age 23, I do not enjoy them as much. Of course, that doesn't necessarily mean that those games are worse. I just found they lack that same magical feeling that the games from my childhood had. Still, I would rate the games from my childhood above other similar games. What's your opinion on this? Do you think that this is purely because children are easier to impress, or is there more to it than that? Also, do you think this is a problem for people who review games? Have you ever encountered it when doing a WTF is? I don't review games. <laughs> Finally, do you think the same principle can be applied to traditional media, like books, movies, or do those work differently? Well, I don't think they do work differently, but firstly, let me point out, I don't review games. I've never done a game review in my life. Those are the first impressions videos, and they should be treated as such. Reviews require to actually, you know, beat the game. And if you review a game before beating it, you are awful. You're a bad reviewer. Certain standards required there. And unfortunately, a lot of the gaming media don't seem to understand that, which is why we have a lot of bad gaming media. But hey, I am not a reviewer. All right, on the thing about nostalgia, the principle can be applied to books and movies and the thing about it is though when it comes to books in particular consider this books don't really advance with technology yeah so you can read an old book and it can be just as good as a new book you play an old game there are problems there when it comes to games you've it's a medium that is not fully developed yet and back in the day there were problems. I mean, the obvious one is graphical fidelity. For instance, the technology just simply isn't there yet. There's also an issue of sound quality and things like that, and more modern games are better in that regard. But more to the point, you've also got an issue of mechanics and the development of mechanics over the course of a period of time. The way that we design games has evolved over the past 30 to 40 years. Now, some of that evolution has gone in the wrong direction, as evolution has a tendency to do every now and again. Let's hope it gets stamped out over the next six million years. But a lot of it has gone in the right direction and is a clear improvement on previous stuff. When it gets a bit hazy is stuff like, say, Final Fantasy VII. Are the battle mechanics of modern RPGs an improvement on that of Final Fantasy VII? Because there is a lot of simplicity in Final Fantasy VII when it comes to its battle mechanics. Hell, Final Fantasy in general has usually just been about hit monster. Yeah? Turn-based, attack this, use magic. There's some strategy underneath that, but the mechanics are actually quite clunky. I mean, you've got to look at, say, Final Fantasy VII and say, this battle format is quite archaic. And some people still enjoy that battle format. And then you run into that problem. Well, some people still like that stuff, and some people don't. Some people have moved on from it, some people haven't. And as a result, some people still love games like Final Fantasy VII. Some people have realized that, yes, they enjoy them much more in their childhood. There's also the idea of Wanderlust and Discovery, in that once you know everything there is to know about a game, you're not as enthused about going into it. For instance, Final Fantasy VII back in the day had all sorts of crazy rumors, like the idea that you could revive Ares, for instance. Yeah, that's something to consider. But, of course, we know that's not the case now. And all of those rumors and the idea that everyone didn't know absolutely everything there was to know about Final Fantasy VII made it a little bit more of a spectacular event. 
right now we know everything there is to know and the thing is that happens every time we get a new game as well for instance the same thing i think actually happened with deus ex human revolution we saw loads of people acting that way oh my god look at this stuff that i just found there's still shots of that appearing on reddit a couple of months after the game came out so that happens i think that we discover perhaps more about games now and games are dissected much much quicker of course, it helps that you release big, massive Brady guides and things like that that have all of this information given by the developers, so a game is half known before it even gets on the shelf. But when it comes down to nostalgia, while it does colour people's perceptions, those games, those old games, certainly do still have a lot of value to them. But it's worth revisiting those games every now and again, and of course, trying to look past the obvious stuff like graphics and sound, looking towards the idea of, well... Were the mechanics solid, and are they still solid in comparison to current mechanics? Or is it simply a case of development over time and the evolution of the medium has allowed gaming to reach greater heights? And then, of course, you've got to figure out, well, is that an objective fact? Is that a good statement that can be proven, or is that an opinion? If someone says that, say, Final Fantasy XII is better than Final Fantasy VII, that's a subjective opinion. Can you even prove mechanically that one is better than the other? No, you can't, because there's too much differentiation there. You cannot prove that one is mechanically better than the other. So, as with film, to some degree, it really does come down to personal opinion, and it always will. And it's really hard to judge on that basis. Okay, folks, that's me done for the day. Thank you very much for watching The Mailbox, and I will see you next time.